So what I'm going to work with is a color called ultramarine blue, which I think some of you might be familiar with. I want you also to consider a tilt in your working surface in some way. So if you have a table that's flat, put all of your paint on the flat part of the table and try to have some way to lift your paper into an angle. If you have a drawing board or you have a sketchbook that you could put the paper onto and then tilt the sketchbook, um, that would be great. Now I have a tube of ultramarine blue. This is Italian, an Italian company, company, my Mary Blue. They make a nice pigment. I could also though, don't forget, if you have this kind of palette, that's fine as well. You can use your um, box palette colors. And what you simply need to do is work the color out of the palette and move it into your dish area or your secondary area. Or you could use one of these zones of your palette to fill your little area of mixture that you're gonna make. But what we wanna do is we want to take some pigment and in my case, ultramarine blue, and we wanna suspend that pigment in water. So I'm gonna squeeze a little bit of this out off to the side, and I'm gonna stir this with my brush into a solution so that I have a nice, I say reasonably saturated. We don't wanna to go too dark today because we wanna get used to the color and used to what it's gonna do in terms of its blendability. Another tool that would be really helpful today if you have one is a paper towel, okay? A paper towel that you can then do some drying of the brush on in order to do some of the different techniques that we're going to play with. Now, you always can dabble your brush off to the side of your paper to remove some of the color and work with the brush, get the brush ready to work. That's what's called dressing the brush. Dressing the brush is a process of loading the brush with paint and then taking some of the paint off of the brush so that the brush has less paint in it and therefore allows you a little bit more control over how that paint is going to flow out of the brush. We call that dressing the brush. And we're going to do some dressing of the brush today. Now, I can also do the same thing on a paper towel, you can see here is I can dress my brush on the paper towel, which allows me to make it less filled with paint. And again, that's gonna be a critical thing of today is we're gonna work with different amounts of paint in the brush to control what's happening. I've mixed up my blue. Some of the blue is unmixed. So if I do this and turn it, you can see that the blue is gathering in the lower area of this palette and the blob of paint is still up in the upper ridge of the palette. So here's the key I want you to see. This came right out of the tube at the top. This is the area that I've actually, I've worked with water. And so this lower area is what we call suspended pigment. The pigment has been suspended in the water and it becomes a solution, a perfect solution. If I took this, and looked at it in a glass, it would look like blue Kool-Aid. It would have that complete blueness through its entire core. And so that's what we want to work with for our paint, what's called suspended pigment. A watercolor is not made by taking the paint out of the tube and putting it on the paper like you would with oil paint, removing the paint from the tube and spreading it around like a butter. We take that paint and we stir it into water and make a solution and that's what gets painted with. So here's my blue solution, and I'm just gonna move right up here and make a little test to see what it looks like. Remember, we wanna work on the front side of our watercolor paper, so remind yourself how to find that. Okay, if you have a book of paper like some of you showed me, it's usually the facing side towards the cover, the side when you flip the cover over, it's the side facing you. If you buy individual sheets of watercolor paper, you have to pay attention to the watermark. And don't ever forget that the watermark on Arches paper, the French company Arches, always reads backwards when you're looking at the front of the paper. That's the weirdest thing. I've always felt like they should do it the other way around so you could read it correctly and then you knew you had the front, but of course they have it backwards. Okay, we're gonna call this colored water today. This is our colored water.
the suspended pigment. I'm gonna take that as full as I can. I'm gonna to try to keep it from dripping and I'm gonna move it to where I wanna paint. And then I'm going to start by putting the first stroke down and I'm gonna work horizontally. Now, why am I working horizontally? Because if I work horizontally, the paint will not run downhill really fast. It will go slowly. So if I work slowly downward, I'm gonna achieve what's called a bead. And the bead is that heavier area at the bottom of the wash area of color. And what I'm gonna to do to make a beautiful shape, it's nice and flat and has no variation in its flatness and a nice clean shape. I'm gonna just simply float and move that bead downhill. When the bead is done, or when I'm done with the shape, the bead will collect. And when I'm done with it, I'm going to squeeze my brush and I'm going to use the brush like a mop and I'm gonna suck the bead off of the surface, sipping it up with the tip of the brush. I don't wanna press the brush in and smear it out. I wanna just slip, sip it off the surface. I want you to think about like a hummingbird going into the nectar and just sipping it right off that surface. And you're gonna sip it until that surface is perfectly even in its moisture content, and you'll end up with a nice flat shape. So the question was, and it was a great question, how do I make the bead big along the whole shape? It seems like I'm only getting it to be a big puddle towards the end of the stroke. And what that has to do with how you go about releasing the water out of the brush. This is where your brush wants to be a brush that releases water. So if you have a nice soft brush like I'm using, I use these natural hair brushes called sable brushes. But if you have any brush that's a nice soft brush, it should release a lot of water for you when you touch it. But one of the things I do, I want you to see, I'll go very slowly, is I'm going to take that color in the brush and I'm gonna to touch and I'm gonna spin the brush and kind of twist it as I'm putting it down on the paper. So I'm, I'm giving the brush a turn and a twist with my thumb and my finger. And what that does is it helps to make the paint come out of the brush on that first stroke. I'm gonna do it again until I get that nice sufficient puddle and once you get the puddle, it's usually pretty easy to keep that puddle going by just continuing to dip, dip, dip into that paint on the palette. Let me bring my palette back into view and remind you that you wanna definitely dip deep and saturate that brush so that you're bringing a lot of liquid to the paper. It's the one thing that people don't do enough of when they're painting with watercolor, they don't use enough liquid. They don't use enough wetness. They don't use enough water. So I want you to think, we're working with colored water here. We're working with blue colored water, but I still need the water to do the work for me. The ability to make a flat shape with a perfect flatness like this, like you're seeing from me, this is such a really important technique because it sets the groundwork for everything else we do. Now what I would like to do with technique number two, and technique number three is I'd like to make a shape with a not sharp edge. So this is a flat shape, but it also has sharp edges. And those sharp edges are happening because we're painting the wet color water right onto a dry piece of paper. So we're not allowing that paint to move away from its borders. That color and that water will not move past the border where the wet meets the dry. As soon as there's dry paper, that dry paper acts like a boundary and stops the shape. So what we wanna do now is think about what we can do to create a shape that has not hard edges or sharp edges, but blurry edges and soft edges, what we call a soft edge shape. This is another necessary shape for painting. There's a lot of times a painting needs to have a blurry edge shape. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take some clean water. And I'm going to put the clean water at the top space above 
where the shape is going to be. So at this point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn on another light, okay, so that we have a little bit of glare. So I'm putting water down first, and I'm going to put it above where I want my shape to start. And so you can see the bottom of the water is right here. Now, as I do this with clean water, the clean water will form a bead at the bottom just like my colored water did. It has an area that collects and gets a little bit thicker. I kind of want to leave it a little bit thick because I'm then going to transition from the clean water into the colored water. And when I do that, I'll get a blurry edge. So watch what happens when I take now my brush and I fill it with the colored water and I touch that edge and I work down from here. And you notice I'm continuing to feed my bead. I'm continuing to feed and feed. And what you see happening is I ended up with a shape that fills the rest of the page. The blue creates a flat. By the way, now I'm lifting my bead up. I'm squeezing and lifting. But notice what happened at the top edge of this shape. The top edge of the shape is no longer sharp. In fact, the top edge of the shape is blurring because the area of colored water and the area of clean water are mushing and blending together. These two areas are bleeding, is what we call it. And so when we use the bleed, we use it to create edge differentials in our painting. Okay, so we're gonna take some clean water. This is the clean water. I'm gonna make some glare happen. Now you can see where that clean water is, right? I'm gonna put a generous amount of clean water. I don't wanna put just a little skinny thing. I want to put a lot. If this clean water up here dries, we'll never see it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I put water everywhere. The only place that it will be visible is where there's color in it, okay? So now this area right here is the boundary between wet and dry. If I, again, work the glare, you can see that's where I have wet and dry, right here under my brush and I'm going to just touch that clean water and continue. Feels like I'm painting a flat shape like technique number one, but instead of that flat shape being just one color, that flat shape is made with two colors. One of them is clear and the other has pigment mixed in. Of course, when we finish, we wanna squeeze and we want to lift and get rid of the bead so that it doesn't create any issues with us later. On that note, I want to show you what issues we're talking about. So I'm going to make a shape down here, just a little one, and I'm going to leave the bead like that for a while for the rest. Let's leave that alone for the rest of the day and watch what happens, okay? Technique number three is going to be the same exact kind of process, except I'm going to start with colored water and I'm going to finish with clean water. And the question about how much of a bead I want, this is one where you really want to kind of manage that. So I'm going to start with my colored water and I'm going to work downhill. Of course, always downhill. Okay, downhill matters. Okay, now I'm going to get to the point where when I want to transition, if I have a nice bead like this, and I want this to start to create a soft edge, so I'm going to go from this blue to clear. I want this to go from blue to clear. If I start with clear water now, there's too much blue there, and it's going to flood my clear water. So the first step is I want to take my brush and squeeze it, and I want to get rid of most of that bead, and then I want to rinse the brush. You could hear that, I think. I'm going to get some clean water in the brush, okay? So let's get the clean water in the brush. 
And I'm now gonna go from the clean water into this area that is not really thick with blue. It's gotta be brought back because you can see how quickly that blue floods into the clean water. And what I wanna do is continue with the clean water for a while. Okay, and it looks like the blue is flooding it, doesn't it? Until I stop and I squeeze. And at this point, I'm gonna lift and get rid of that bead. And when I do, I'm gonna be able to lift away a lot of that blue that leaked downhill. You can see I'm lifting away all of that clean water and some of that blue that floated into the clean water is going to disappear with it. And so what we end up with is a flat shape with a soft edge at the bottom or in the finishing zone of when we're completing the shape at the bottom of gravity. So I'm gonna do that one again just to show you that transition moment because it's really important that you don't try to rush that moment. You, you have to move swiftly and zen-like, but you don't wanna rush it. So we're gonna take that colored water, we're gonna bring it down to a point where we want that edge to become soft. Okay, and this is where I don't want necessarily a really big bead because I don't, I don't wanna transition with a lot of a bead of that blue, I wanna get rid of it. So I'm gonna take that brush and squeeze it. I'm gonna lift away the bead, get rid of it, and then fairly quickly rinse the brush and get my clean water and then just touch and move that clean water away from the edge. And at this point, I go in and I lift that water away. And if any blue floated into the water, I can get rid of it. So that's how we finish with a soft edge. If you learn these three techniques, you've learned the majority of how to paint. And that is we've dealt with everything that involves what we call blocking in shapes. When we block in shapes in a painting, we basically establish the ground tones for everything in our work. Okay, so the first three techniques are what we call the blocking in techniques. And then the next set of techniques, the last four, are all what we call modeling techniques. Four through seven are all what we call modeling techniques. And modeling is when we want to take any zone of blocked in color and we want to give that color some variation and nuance to make it more interesting. So for instance, if we are blocking in the tones on a portrait, we're taking the big shapes of shadow, the big shapes of light, and we're just massing them in, in large masses. But what are we going to do if we want to go and tickle up the core of the shadow or add a transition where the cheek gets a little more rosy. Those are what we call modeling techniques where we wanna modify the area that way. So modeling technique number one to learn is one of the simplest to learn. It's actually also one of the more fun to learn. And it's what's called wet into wet painting. What it means simply is that if I wet my paper with water, clean water, and then I put colored water into that area, basically every time my brush touches the paper, that color will bleed into the paper. It will not remain a sharp shape. What I'm gonna do is take my clean water, I'm gonna grab the brush and load it up, okay? And I'm gonna take this clean water and I'm gonna just flood the whole zone of the paper that I would like to work in. And I'm being quite generous with it, but I'm also, I'm not having to worry about the bead and going downhill because what I'm really just trying to do is put a nice even layer of water on that surface. And I'm using the brush to brush it out and even it. Now that that's wet, I'm gonna go and bring my color over and I'm gonna take my color 
But now I don't want it too wet in the brush and I don't want it too weak in its saturation. I want more saturation because there's water on the paper already and it's gonna desaturate as it touches. I'm gonna to load up that brush and I'm gonna bring it to the page and I'm gonna start laying shapes in. And when I do, you can see they bleed and blossom out. They kind of explode around their edges. So tapping the brush in little dots, that's what's called tipping in. I can take that brush and I can flow an area in with one space and it's gonna slowly crawl along. When I use this technique, I tell people, right now I'm doing wet into wet. The paper is wet and my brush is pretty wet. If I take that brush and I dry it out a little bit, I can work damp into wet. And when I work damp into wet, I'm going to get a lot more control. It's going to bleed less because I'm not introducing a huge amount of water into that surface. I'm going to go very saturated now. And I'm going to really dry the brush. And now you can see I can even add really detailed work where that detailed work is holding on to its drawing quality because I'm not flooding the page with more and more water. When we talk about wet into wet painting or wet into wet technique, we want to remember that we call it wet into wet technique, but we don't mean it always has to be wet into wet. It can also be damp into wet. It can also be dry into wet. And it can also be damp into damp. We can let this paper dry for a little while until it's not really wet, but drier and more damp instead of wet. And then we can work into the damp surface with a damp brush and again, it will not flow and explode as much. This is a really, really useful technique for working where we want everything to be soft and blurry in the painting. And it's really one of the only ways to get consistently soft and blurry shapes in whole entire zones. The one thing you do want to remember is that when you work with the, this technique, get what you're interested in and then stop and let it dry. A lot of people fail with this technique because they keep going into this and trying to get more and more to happen in this piece of paper. And as the paper is drying, it's not going to dry evenly. And every time you work into an unevenly dry piece of paper, you're going to get anomalies that occur that are odd and strange in the way the paint sits and creates blended edges. I would urge you to use this technique, use it a lot. Wet your paper with clean water, put your paint in and work the paint the way you want it, and then once you have something you're happy with, stop and leave it alone and let it dry and be patient. Technique number five is dry brush. I'm going to load the color in the brush that I'm interested in using, and I'm going to dry it out on a paper towel for the most part till it's generally dry. And then when I use it in a dry state, it allows me an extreme detail ability to draw. So you can see the kind of very, very fine drawing type of technique I can get with a dry brush. So I can use cross hatching. I can use buildup of hatching. I can continue to layer and layer mark making, stippling. I can even take that brush and fan it out into a rough shape and almost create these kind of foggy blends that are happening with the sense that the brush is now dry.
Now, that is a really useful technique for building a lot of detail and modeling in my painting. And essentially, that's it. You dry out the brush to the point that it is just wet enough to paint for you, but really on the dry side so that you have that ability to draw with it. As you work with a brush that's a dry brush and you get it perfect, where you've set it up perfect with the, just the right amount of drying, it's going to feel as if you're working with um, almost a colored pencil. What I would like to do is show you one more variation of this. So I'm going to rinse my brush. Okay, and I'm going to bring my brush into the clean water right now. And I'm going to put a little bit of clean water down like we did on technique number four. So I'm creating a wet area on the bottom little corner there. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work with dry brush into that wet surface. And this is a technique, it's kind of a hybrid between number five and four. And what I love is it creates an extreme ability to draw and model where the modeling is still nice and soft. So let's do a little sphere here. Because the brush is so dry, it allows me really incredible amounts of control in terms of how much I'm whispering that color into that surface. I want to work while the paper is nice and damp. And as the paper dries out, I want to stop and let it recover and dry before I continue. I can always, by the way, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but if I achieve what I'm interested in and I pause, I can always let it dry, re-wet with clean water, and I'm back to square one. I can go back into the painting a second go round with another layer. But again, look at what I'm able to do with dry brush into a wet surface in terms of creating the sense of a sphere. So technique number six is what's called lifting. Okay, and we'll, we'll write that down here. And lifting is the third of the modeling techniques. What we're going to do with lifting is we're going to use the clean water. We're going to be able to lift some of the paint away after it's been applied. And so this is really a nice technique for working negatively or working reductively to create a lighter space. We're going to mix up a nice blue here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint this blue into a round shape, okay? And while it's wet, I need to sort of be quick here. I can't be waiting around and watching it for too long. I'm going to use my clean brush. So rinse my brush, take a little bit of clean water in the brush, and then make sure I'm having a clean brush I can go in and I can use that clean brush to pull away some of the blue before it's had a chance to settle and dry into the paper. If I pull, and notice how I'm pulling in kind of these curvy fashions, I'm able to actually do some reductive or what's called back modeling, where I'm modeling light out of this tone. Okay, the tone is put down first, and then I'm pulling back off of that tone while it's still wet. Now, as I'm pulling away, I'm also drying the paper, and so I want to be consistent, and I want to try to continue to make sure I don't have a bead or anything that could cause uneven dryingness in the page. You're going to notice that when I lift, areas try to crawl back, and when they do, I have to clean the brush grab some clean water, squeeze the clean water out of the brush, and come back and, again, tickle and lift those areas. So the lifting is not, I'm not scrubbing it out of the paper. I don't want to scrub it like I have a scrub brush in my hand. 
you notice my brush is just barely touching and tickling that surface to pull it nice and evenly and gently. So lifting is a technique that allows you to do some reductive work. Lifting is also a really useful technique for just controlling in general your work that you're doing. Now notice what happened over here when we didn't lift the bead off the bottom of our shape. Do you notice how that shape kind of pushed a lot of pigment up to the top edge, everything kind of flooded, it looks all uneven? That's the result of not lifting the bead. Notice my upper shapes, how even they are and clean, the bottom one that looks kind of muddy, and that's because I didn't lift away the bead. So even that is a form of lifting. If I'm working on that first technique and laying my shape, and just getting a flat shape down. When I stop, I wanna rinse the brush, and then I wanna squeeze it and bring it to the page to lift and get rid of that water. So a lot of times lifting is not only used for doing this kind of modeling like I've done on the ball down here, but lifting is also used to control the amount of water that's on that paper to keep the water from doing weird things in my painting. So technique number seven, I always put in the category of modeling. But one of the things I wanna talk about about modeling is when you're modeling a form like a sphere, there's times where you want that highlight to be really nice and bright. But what's happening with our highlight? Our highlight is still slightly blue because using a technique like lifting, I'm not able to get the highlight off the paper perfectly because some of the blue stained the paper before I could lift it. And so when we have those situations, we have to figure out a way to maintain a bright point of light that's in an area that we don't wanna paint around it because it's too complicated to kind of paint around that little bright point. And so we use the final technique that we learn, and that's number seven, and that's called masking. And masking is simply putting things onto the paper that resist the watercolor and make it so that the watercolor does not stick. And so one of the things we use is tape. So if I put some tape down, I can take my color and I can paint it right onto the tape and into the paper. I can even look at what I'm doing going all over the tape and I'll bring that down. And then I'll lift my bead. I'll get rid of some of these drips. And when I peel the tape, I get a nice clean edge because I've masked away the edge from the watercolor being able to adhere to the paper. I'm happening to use that blue painter's tape and blue painter's tape is a pretty good tape for repelling the watercolor and putting down what we call a masking area. I can do that not only with tape, but I can do that with other substances. So the next substance I'm gonna show you is what's called masking fluid. Essentially, this is liquid rubber. It's latex. So if you have a latex allergy, be careful. I never wanna dip a really expensive brush into this stuff because this stuff will just destroy brushes. So I'm actually gonna use the end of my brush and I'm gonna put some little spots of it up here. You can see three little dots that I'm making. And what we'll do is we'll put some paint there later on once those have had a chance to dry. I never wanna paint over them while they're wet because it's again, liquid rubber. And if they're wet, what will happen? It will ruin my brush because it will get in my brush. Okay, I wanna let these dry for a minute. And once they're dry, we'll paint on top of those. The other kind of masking that we can do is with what's called masking film. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. It's a roll and it's essentially a big piece of plastic tape, basically. Imagine I have a shape in my painting that's curved like this. I can take masking film, 
really adhere it over the curve. I'm gonna take a nice sharp X-Acto knife and I'm going to cut along that perimeter. I'm gonna peel away the part I don't want to paint. Okay, and then at that point, I'm gonna take my brush with my color and I'm gonna again work against this edge. I wanna paint away from masking tape, masking film. I don't wanna to paint towards it. I wanna to always paint away from it. So actually, ideally, I would turn this upside down. So I would use gravity away from that edge. Once I've painted my shape and I'm happy with what it's done, I'm gonna lift that and I can get a nice area of the painting to control around a very complicated little edge that allows me to, um, to sort of control where that paint sits and where it doesn't sit. Again, the advantage of masking film is that they're big wide sheets and they're totally transparent so that you can cut right through them. And then finally, it looks like we're really close to having this, um, these areas dry the liquid rubber. I'm just going to test them, make sure that it's not coming off on my finger. And we're good. And so I can take my paint and I can paint them over those areas. And again, lift the bead. And sure enough, what happened? Those areas of liquid rubber resisted the paint. And once this is dry, I can go in and lift those little rubbery spots with uh, an eraser or with what's called a rubber cement pickup, which is a tool that's used to rub rubber cement away from a painting. And the rubber cement pickup looks like this. It's a tool that's like an eraser, but it's a little bit more sticky. And so when you touch it to something like the liquid mask, the liquid mask pops right off. Anything else that resists water is going to work. John Singer Sargent was known as using wax as a setup tool for allowing areas of the painting to remain white like highlights. The problem with using wax is once you put it on the paper, you'll never be able to get watercolor to go there. Whereas with my masking fluid or my films, once I lift them out of the way, I can go back and paint over those areas and I can make them um, different colors. So I could go in with some, for instance, I could take some red now, and I could go in and add a little spot of red into the center of that little area, and it will pink up that dot and let the blue remain blue.